the rocks and the mountains shall all flee away, and you shall have a new hiding place that day. Seek her, seek her, give up your heart to God, and you shall have a new hiding place that day. Welcome to Clinton Church Restoration's online community read of The Souls of Black Folk by W.E.B. Du Bois. The mission of Clinton Church Restoration is to create an African-American heritage site and cultural center at the historic Clinton AME Zion Church in Great Barrington, Massachusetts, where W.E.B. Du Bois was born and raised. As a cultural hub inspired by Du Bois' work as a seminal writer, scholar, and activist, This new center will use interpretive exhibits and contemporary programming to explore his complex life and legacy, celebrate the work of this freedom church, and share hidden and untold stories of African-American life in rural New England. Our 14-week community read of The Souls of Black Folk will be moderated by Dr. Francis Jones Sneed, historian, board member, and chair of our Scholars Council. Each week she will be joined by a guest scholar for a presentation of a single chapter of Du Bois' classic text, followed by a discussion with the audience. If you are joining us live, we invite and appreciate your participation. Please enter your questions into the Q&A box. For best results, we recommend you have the most recent version of the Zoom app downloaded on your device. Attendees watching via a browser may not have all the interactive features available. To see the full schedule for this community read or to learn more about the project, please visit our website at clintonchurchrestoration.org. Thanks for joining us. Children, children, give up your heart to God and you shall have a new hiding place that day. People, people, give up your heart to God, and you shall have a new hiding place that day. All the rocks and the mountains shall all flee away, and you shall have a new hiding place that day. Session of the community reading of W.E.B. Du Bois's The Souls of Black Folk. We are pleased to have with us this evening our guest scholar, Dr. Barbara McCaskill from the University of Georgia. Dr. McCaskill is a professor of English co-director of the Civil Rights Digital Library Initiative and Associate Academic Director of the Wilson Center for Humanities and Arts. She is co-editor of Postbellum Pre-Harlem African-American Literature and Culture, 1877 to 1919, and author of Love, Liberation, and Escaping Slavery, William and Ellen Craft in Cultural Memory. She also edited and wrote an introduction to the 1860 memoir, Running, 1,000 Miles for Freedom, The Escape of William and Ellen Craft from Slavery. We will begin by asking uh, Dr. McCaskill to comment on chapter five, and then we will have questions from the audience. If you have a question at any time, please put it in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Uh, Welcome, Dr. McCaskill. Oh, thank you so much, Professor Joan Sneed. I am honored and absolutely delighted to be here with you and the Clinton Church Restoration Community Project today to talk about Du Bois's Souls of Black Folk, Chapter 5, Of the Wings of Atalanta. And I am so pleased that you assigned me this particular chapter because I am not a Georgia native, but I certainly come from a long line of Georgians and Black Southerners. I've lived in Georgia 
for many decades now, and I am very deeply involved, as we both are, in higher education. So all of these vectors in my own personal life and my own life as a teacher and as a community member have come together in this chapter. And I also appreciate your assigning this chapter to me because I have to admit <laughs> that I am one of the um, uh, 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 terrible people that too often in my own teaching, because I use anthologies quite a bit in my literature classes, I never get past chapter two or chapter three <laughs> in the souls of black folk, because as you've mentioned in your publicity for this project, so very often because of how Du Bois is presented to us in anthologies, we don't read the whole book. So I appreciate it and I thank you and your colleagues very much for pressing me forward to think beyond uh, chapters one and two and of the coming of John and of the sorrow songs. These are the most anthologized chapters of his book and to delve into these middle chapters that are no less stunning in their content and in their poeticality. I am a literature professor as you introduced me. And so in my uh, brief remarks before we have the Q&A today, I'm gonna move back, back and forth between themes or content and style because I am bowled over once again by what a masterful and creative writer and artist Du Bois was as well as scholar. So if you could pull up the first si slide, please, we'll begin. And I've, I've, I've included slides that are cued to the Dover edition of Du Bois's Souls of Black Folk. So you'll see page numbers from time to time next to material that I have quoted from this particular edition. And they're all cued to this edition. If you would cue to the next slide, please. All right, I want to begin where my colleagues who have facilitated discussions of the last four chapters begin, and that is with the dual epigraphs that begin this chapter. We have a quotation from a poem entitled Howard in Atlanta by John Greenleaf Whittier, as well as a few bars from the Sorrow Songs you heard the wonderful singer singing rocks and mountains. I'm going to share with you a slightly different version of that. There are many ad adaptations of rocks and mountains, but again, to create cohesion and unity throughout the book as he moves from topic to topic, we have this consistent use of epigraphs to set the tone and to establish the broader themes that Du Bois is thinking about. And in this chapter, one of the broad themes that he is thinking about is the relationship between African-Americans and the white community. And he's using Atlanta in many ways throughout this particular chapter as a symbol of reunion. He comes out of a period in American literature, the 1870s, 1880s, and 1890s, when American writers were concerned with how they were going to knit together black and white northern, uh, northerner and southerner after the war. In his particular case, Du Bois is thinking about how he can find points of intersection, mutuality, filiality, commonality between black and white. And I believe this is one reason why he chooses Howard in Atlanta. Another theme of this particular chapter is of course the role that historically black colleges and universities will play in helping African-Americans to become productive citizens and to have access to the full rights of citizenship. So he quotes from this poem as well because the poem thinks about the project of African-American education after the Civil War. Looking at the book on page 47, the particular stanza that he quotes from Howard in Atlanta depicts an African-American 
freed person, as we would call him, a newly emancipated young boy who is trying to get an education. And he is communicating in the stanza on page 47 with General Oliver Otis Howard. And it is not uh, coincidental that the poet John Greenleaf Whittier juxtaposes this formerly enslaved African-American boy with General Oliver Otis Howard. Oliver Otis Howard became the director of the Freedmen's Bureau. So he worked very closely uh, with the formerly enslaved African-Americans in the South to help them gain rights and privileges during that sliver of a window during Reconstruction. General Oliver Otis Howard was known as the Christian general because he was very principled. He was a very religious man, but he also believed in walking the walk as well as talking the talk. So he was constantly intervening on behalf of the freed people to make sure that they were being paid good wages by the white people that they ended up working for. They weren't being cheated out of pensions if they were widows. They were getting their pay if they were African-American soldiers. He really went above and beyond the call of duty in order to ensure that African-Americans in the South after the war had a good start. The author of this poem, Howard in Atlanta, was himself deeply involved in relationships with African-Americans. John Greenleaf Whittier was a major poet in 19th century American literature. He was one of what we call the fireside or schoolroom poets, which would include uh, Oliver Wendell Holmes, uh, Longfellow, for example. They were called schoolroom poets because their poems communicated what we would think of now as American values, patriotism, justice. And they were called schoolroom poets because their poems were easily memorized and were taught with that goal in mind to be memorized. Uh, you can hear the poems of John Greenleaf Whittier in the speeches, for example, of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, who going to historically black schools also memorized the poetry of John Greenleaf Whittier. His poems were memorized by African-Americans in churches as well, because John Greenleaf Whittier in part made his name by writing about slavery and using his gift as an artist to beat back against slavery and to help the anti-slavery cause. So by quoting from this particular poem, Howard in Atlanta, Du Bois is beginning his chapter by paying homage to the anti-slavery movement by thinking about the past of enslavement out of which African-Americans have come, which is a theme that he's threaded throughout the four chapters preceding this and inviting us to anticipate what comes next. Now that we're free as African-Americans, are we really free? What are the steps that we have to take in order to gain the full rights of citizenship? This poem, Howard in Atlanta, presents a young African-American on the verge, newly emancipated, looking forward to his freedom. I'm just going to read the stanza that Du Bois uses, and then I'm going to invite us to think more deeply about the poem. What does Du Bois leave out that he would have assumed his readers who were more well-versed in Whittier, Whittier's work than we are would know about? And why is what he's left out just as meaningful as what's on the page? One more word about General Howard before I read this stanza that Du Bois has excerpted. General Howard, is the Howard of Howard University. Howard University was named in honor of him. Remember, I told you that he became the first director 
of the Freedmen's Bureau. So here's the stanza that Du Bois begins with, and then I'm going to invite you to take a look at my slide that includes a stanza that was left out. And I think that stanza also is very meaningful. Oh, black boy of Atlanta, but half was spoken. The slave chains and the masters alike are broken. The one curse of the races held both in tether. They are rising. All are rising, the black and white together. So it's not hard uh, to overlook the themes of mutuality, of relationship, of community, of black and white, bridging the divide between them to create a stronger union in the wake of civil war. The one curse of the races held both in tether, slavery, and the perceptions or stereotypes about people of African descent that help to underpin slavery. What does our uh, writer Du Bois leave out? There was the human, this is just one of many stanzas, but I think it's a very telling stanza uh, as an example of what he omits that his readers would have likely known. There was the human chattel, its manhood taking. There, in each dark brown statue, a soul was waking. The man of many battles, with tears his eyelids pressing, stretched over those dusky foreheads his one-armed blessing. This stanza precedes, it comes before the stanza that I just read that Du Bois has written. And it tells us again about this relationship unfolding between this young uh, black child who is just beginning really his progress through life and this wizened, battle-hardened general who has seen death, who has seen greed, who's seen the worst of humanity, but is ecstatic at seeing now the vision of his struggles being fulfilled. He fought a war to end slavery. It has happened even if contingently, and he is excited about that. What Du Bois's readers do that we probably didn't know, because if you were like me when I read this chapter the first time, I didn't know who General Oliver Otis Howard was. In addition to being the director of the Freedmen's Bureau, in addition to uh, being known as the Christian general, it is important to know that General Oliver Otis Howard lost an arm in battle, in fighting Johnny Reb, in fighting the Confederates, he lost an arm. So this vision is incomplete. The vision or the visual that Du Bois draws is incomplete if we don't understand that there is a man who is wounded, stretching out his hand to a young African-American who also represents the people who have been wounded and traumatized. It is a very overt symbol of how both black and white were harmed by slavery and the way forward is for both black and white to be together. And also, we cannot overlook that this poem is suggesting an important theme of this chapter, the way forward is through knowledge, the way forward is through education but a particular kind of education that African-Americans at places like Howard University, Fisk University have to cultivate very carefully. Next slide, please. All right, and just very quickly, the epigraph reinforces these themes of coming out of struggle but at the same time, continuing the struggle. Um, this is a variation of the uh, sorrow song, Rocks and Mountains, that communicates similar themes. The idea of overcoming struggle, overcoming impediments, overcoming injustice. 
If you read the last couple of lines on this slide, it got a little wonky <laughs> in transition. Uh, the anonymous author uh, writes, the trump shall sound and the dead shall rise. And notice the uh, way in which the rising here of the dead um, that is foretold in the book of Revelations, the idea of resurrection rhymes with the idea of they are rising, all are rising in the excerpt from John Greenleaf Whittier's poem that Du Bois is using. So while Du Bois flashes back to the struggle of slavery, he also uses this idea of rising both in the song fragment and in the poem to suggest an optimistic outlook, a way forward, a continued struggle. The struggle is not over, but the idea is that the struggle will uh, bear out in progress in African-Americans attaining a stronger sense of who they are as Americans, a stronger claim to their role in American society. Next slide, please. Uh, so another wonderful way in which as a writer, Du Bois structures this discussion of education, of the tools that African-Americans need to move out of slavery into freedom is by thinking about and inviting us as readers to think about the Greek myth of Atalanta, Hippomenes, and the golden apples. And on page 48 of the chapter, he summarizes this myth. Atalanta was an athletic woman. She didn't want to get married. Um, she would invite any suitor to race with her. And if they beat her, they could marry her. And she knew full well that she would always win. She was absolutely a top athlete. Hippomenes sees Atalanta racing against these suitors. He falls in love with him and he makes a mistake that so many people make in Greek and Roman mythology. He asks a favor of the gods. He asks the goddess Aphrodite to give him power to beat Atalanta. So Aphrodite gives him three golden apples and she tells him to throw the apples in front of Atalanta as they're running. They will distract her, she will slow down and he will win. And he does just that. The only problem in this scenario is that even though he beats her, he fails to recognize the gods who have given him these apples like Aphrodite to help him win. And so he is punished for being thankless and his lover, Atalanta, who by the end of the race falls in love with him, is punished as well, and they are transformed into lions. Moral of the story, don't be distracted. And Du Bois uses this idea of distraction to set up his discussion of how the city of Atlanta symbolizes the energy, the progress, the potentiality of African-Americans, yet at the same time poses pitfalls. It, in its story, there are distractions from the goal that African-Americans must be careful of. Just as there are three golden apples in this Greek myth, Du Bois sets up three potential pitfalls, three potential distractions, a wonderful way of structuring this very condensed, very dense work. And those three pitfalls are, next slide, please. Number one, well, next slide, please. Number two uh, pitfall is forgetting the wisdom of the elders forgetting, as he points out, the Black preacher and the Black teacher, metaphors for the collective wisdom of African-American communities. The pursuit of money, wealth for wealth's sake, and wealth barring everything else is 
uh, a potential for African Americans downfall, forgetting the wisdom of the elders, those who have gone before them, the black preacher and the black teacher in their pursuit of wealth is a potential for African American downfall. And number three, which takes us back to some of the earlier discussions of the chapters of the souls of black folk in this community reading. Number three, the third seemingly gleaming golden apple that is rotten at its core, according to Du Bois, is how in their haste to excel, to succeed, to create people who are going to be able to contribute economically to American society in their haste to build schools, Du Bois worries aloud that too many of those schools have been substandard, that too many of those schools, as he points out in this chapter, are little more than high schools. And they don't pay attention to what he thinks is as important as preparing students for skills to make money, to earn bread, just as important, he points out, are schools that prepare young people how to think and who, how to love culture. What do we mean by culture? We mean literature, art, music. For culture's sake, divorced from or divided from the idea of making a dollar. It is to their detriment, he points out, that African-American universities get too blinkered, too blinded by the idea, idea that they can create breadwinners, that they forget that African-Americans as human beings, as persons, to be whole, must have spirits that are devoted just as much to the arts, just as much to culture. And this is where as a teacher, I am very, as a literature teacher, I'm very excited about this chapter because it very strongly makes a case for the humanities. And right now at the university level, we are having ongoing conversations about the value of humanities and arts, the value of a liberal arts education and whether or not we need to put more emphasis on preparing young people for jobs, preparing them to be earners. What about the liberal arts that prepares young people to be lifelong learners and to love learning for learning's sake? What about the liberal arts that prepare young people to think critically, to think independently? All of these ideas are rolled up in this theme that Du Bois posits of being a little too over eager to establish certain kinds of schools, vocational schools, and forgetting that the role of the university is to do both. Yes, to create earners, but also to create thinkers and lovers of literature and art and culture. And I wanna pause here and call your attention to how he models the kind of learning that he calls for in quoting different uh, mythologies, in citing different languages, in using language very artistically. He's modeling what it looks like to be this well-rounded person who is steeped in literature, culture, and music. And if you doubt me, another example of his artistry is how he very subtly calls attention to these pitfalls using language. The most frequently used word in this chapter is the word striving. Um, you may associate that word with the Harlem Renaissance, Strivers Row, but it was quite popular among late 19th century and early 20th century African-American writers to suggest the progress of the race. Striving is a present progressive verb. Verbs that end in ing are called present progressive verbs. And I think that's a very important detail to note because a present progressive verb calls attention to action that is not yet completed. I am striving 
Atlanta is racing. The city of Atlanta is running to become this industrial powerhouse, this economic engine at the turn into the 20th century. A present progressive word like striving really helps epitomize the existential condition of African-Americans at the turn into the 20th century. We have our freedom, but not fully. We have not yet quite arrived yet. We are Americans, but we don't yet quite have that sense of belonging in the American community that we anticipated after emancipation. That sense of incompletion, that sense of lack of resolution, lack of closure, all of that is bundled up in the meaning of striving and the nominal or noun form that Du Bois also uses, strife. Tellingly and artistically and with precision, whenever Du Bois mentions one of these bad apples, wealth, forgetting the wisdom of the elders, the preachers and the teachers, the very origins of African-American institutions, and making the mistake of creating higher education institutions that are too focused on wealth. Whenever Du Bois mentions one of these bad apples, whenever he introduces them, you can fact check me. He does not use those words. He does not use striving. He does not use strife. In other words, we need to understand that for Du Bois, striving and strife are good. They suggest the energy that African-Americans are putting behind determining what their role will be in the United States for themselves. To be in struggle is the African-American condition. It was the condition in slavery and it's the condition out of slavery. And Du Bois is in a way celebrating the spirit of African-American struggle and suggesting that to only focus on wealth, to forget the elders, to only focus on vocational schools, schools that don't think deeply about literature and art. To do that is to divest ourselves of this legacy, to dishonor this legacy. We're prepared to do battle so that we can get it right, in other words. And I just love the way that he uses language so subtly to communicate those meanings. Next slide, please. So this is just a gloss on the idea uh, on page 50, in which he states that these scions of African-American progress, the preacher and the teacher are, as uh, to paraphrase the quote at the top of this slide, are being pushed out by all those with property and money. He presents a kind of romantic notion of teachers and preachers of not uh, being as interested in getting money as they are in, for teachers, the life of the mind, and for preachers, the health of the spirit. Uh, it's a little bit romantic as a teacher, I can tell you that we do want to earn money. But the point is, he wants to call attention to culture to spirit, to these uh, essences of humanity that are not quantifiable that African-Americans have always aspired to, even in slavery, to have a life of the mind, to be literate, to learn how to read. Remember, he begins this chapter with the image of an African-American boy getting an education. These ineffable, unquantifiable qualities of mind and spirit are what Du Bois wants African-American communities at the turn into the 20th century to hold close. He is not averse to money. He understands the importance of making bread, uh, as he uh, calls attention to, to paraphrase. But at the same time, if that is all African-Americans become interested in to the exclusion of everything else, 
than he has a dire prediction in this chapter for African-American progress. Next slide, please. I want to linger uh, just a little bit before I close my remarks on additional points that he makes about the African-American colleges. And the quotation that this slide begins with really celebrates the role that African-American colleges and universities can play in developing Black people who are attuned to culture. We are training not isolated men, but a living group of men, nay, a group within a group. And the final product of our training must be neither a psychologist nor a brick mason, but a man. And to make men, we must have ideals, broad, pure, and inspiring ends of living, not sordid money getting, not apples of gold. There are those apples again. I love the way that he's braiding together this myth of those distracting, gleaming apples that end up causing a lot of grief for Hippomenes and Atalanta. And he braids that together with the uh, goals that will cause grief for African-American communities. This is an image of Atlanta University's Stone Hall. He mentions that toward the end of this chapter where he works and looks out onto a beautiful campus of, as he calls in this passage, inspiring um, African-American men and women. And he uses the patriarchal language of his day, men, to refer to both men and women to humanity. Again, we wouldn't be as familiar with this, but as someone who is in Georgia, at the University of Georgia, I wonder if he also was telegraphing another meaning that's been lost to us over time. Uh, Atlanta, the name of the city, uh, was not the original name. The original name of the city of Atlanta was Marthasville. And Marthasville was named after the daughter of the governor of Atlanta. You see him here, Wilson Lumpkin, whose name was Martha. As Atlanta emerges out of the Civil War and it becomes the transportation hub, Wilson Lumpkin, along with other uh, wealthy white men, invest heavily in the railroad. And they make Atlanta uh, a, a transportation center via the railroad. Wilson Lumpkin owns a railroad called the Western and Atlantic Rail Railroad. And as Atlanta becomes much more of an industrial powerhouse in the decades after the Civil War, as Atlanta begins to reinvent itself as a symbol of the phoenix rising from the ashes, the New South, Wilson Lumpkin and other wealthy white Atlantans realize that Marthasville sounds like too much of a small town name for a great city. So Lumpkin changes the name to Atlanta for his Western and Atlantic Railroad. Get it? Atlantic, Atlanta. At the same time, and coincidentally, his daughter Martha had a nickname. Growing up, she was called Atalanta, as in the myth, because she learned to walk very early. Um, we don't know for sure if Wilson Lumpkin had that in mind as well when he named the city of Atlanta, uh, Atlanta, but I think it's also interesting that he does have a personal connection to Atlanta. Well, here at the University of Georgia, the Lumpkin family used to own much of the campus. They owned a plantation and where East Campus uh, now is, was once the Lumpkin family plantation. And uh, the house where Governor Wilson Lumpkin lived still stands on the University of Georgia's campus. For legal reasons, UGA cannot move that house or we have to uh, relinquish the property. And that would be very difficult to do with so many buildings and so many residence halls. Anyway, I wonder if Du Bois's readers, particularly those who were from the area of Atlanta in Georgia, they would have likely known 
about the Lumpkin House in Athens, it also is a stone house. Um, so I think that what Du Bois is doing with Stone Hall and the idea of the Lumpkin family relating to the story of Atlanta is suggesting, as he did at the very beginning of this chapter, something coming out of the past. Wilson Lumpkin was not only a slaveholder, but he was one of the architects of Cherokee and Creek removal. My colleague, Claudio Sant here in the history department invites us to think not of removal, but of deportation, the Trail of Tears. Uh, he was one of the architects of that. So he has a long relationship to histories of oppression of people of color. And so it's interesting that Du Bois may be creating this opposition or tension between that past of slaveholding, of Native American genocide, and this present places like Stone Hall rising out of the earth, suggesting a different way for African Americans to be in the world, self-determined, taking initiative, moving forward. I'm going to end by just reading very quickly the last paragraph of this chapter, because I do think that it offers once again a cautionary tale at the same time that it suggests optimism. I'm on page 54. Du Bois is using a literary device called framing, as in picture frame. He's creating a kind of border around his discussion. He began by calling Atlanta the city of 100 hills. He ends by calling Atlanta a city, the city of 100 hills. He began by talking about Atlanta uh, as this industrial city with the smoke rising from the factories. And he ends by inviting us to look at the sky. When night falls on the city of a hundred hills, a wind gathers itself from the seas and comes murmuring westward. And at its bidding, the smoke of the drowsy factory sweeps down upon the mighty city and covers it like a pall. While yonder at the university, the stars twinkle above Stone Hall. And they say that yon gray mist is the tunic of Atalanta pausing over her golden apples. Fly, my maiden, fly, for yonder comes Hippomenes. The juxtaposition or the opposition or the tension that Du Bois is creating here by using such images as smoke from drowsy factories. Remember, he talked about the still and sleepy factories at the beginning of this chapter. Uh, the imagery that he's calling attention to by uh, rendering the wind as like a pall, a funeral covering over the city, that is meant to invite us to pay more attention to the universities, which offer a contrast. Remember, these are African-American schools that he's talking about, schools like Atlanta University in the city. Yonder, while all this smoke and mist is over the city, yonder, far away at the university, the stars twinkle above Stone Hall. So there's a sense that out of this struggle, out of this yet incomplete uh, community that Americans, again, have not yet fulfilled, out of this yet incomplete mutuality between the races, there is a glimmer of hope offered by this image of Stone Hall with the stars twinkling above it. And the hope does not come just out of making money putting money in the bank, savings accounts, opening banks. The hope comes out of learning for learning's sake. The hope comes out of a love of the liberal, liberal arts, the old trivium and quadrivium, as he points out in this chapter, math, astronomy, the sciences, music, rhetoric, logic. These stimulate the mind to be critical thoughtful, reflective, and also they nurture the spirit. Thank you.
Thank you, Barbara. Uh, it's it's great that you're over. I mean, it, it was <laughs> bravo. Uh, <laughs> what a wonderful presentation. And I, I really love how you delved into that chapter and just- oh, I do a close reading. <laughs> yes, you did do a close reading of that chapter, Barbara. <laughs> so you demonstrated to us how to do a close reading of a chapter. And so I think that's great. Um, but we're going to go very um, quickly to Q&As. Um, okay. uh, uh, can you explain what he meant, asked Dina Fisher, uh, with the uh, quote, teach workers to work, a wise saying, wise when applied to German boys and American girls, wiser when said of Negro boys, for they have less knowledge of working and none to teach them. Okay, um, as I recall, he's making this comment about teaching workers to work, while at the same time, he also calls attention to the need to teach thinkers to think. And again, I think what he's trying to do is caution African Americans to be more discriminating in our idea of education. There's a place for vocational education. I think it's a misunderstanding to look at Du Bois as turning his nose up at the farmers and the brick masons of the world, just as it is a mistake to think that Booker T. Washington didn't care for learning languages. It's a mistake to think that Booker T. Washington didn't care for learning about Greek and Roman mythology. Both of these leaders at the beginning of the 20th century understood that there was a time and a place for both kinds of knowledge. And I think that's what Du Bois is getting at in this statement, that we need to understand that there are different kinds of knowledge and that's okay. But if we become too blinkered as African-Americans on only the kind of knowledge that can make a fast buck, we're in trouble. <laughs> and this is where this chapter really resonates with me as I pointed out, again, as humanity scholars, we are constantly engaging with our institutions about the value of what we do. How does it translate into jobs? That's the question that we're asked over and over again. Although I will always point out that we know that businesses snap up humanities majors because we have that liberal arts education. We are widely read. We can communicate clearly, precisely. But yes, he's calling attention to this false dichotomy that can be drawn about education but also at the same time, trying to instill a value for the liberal arts and the humanities. Yes, Barbara Flanagan asked a question that I think that you asked, uh, have already answered um, in uh, your comments. What role do women have in Du Bois's thinking? Are they included in his idea to teach workers to work and teach thinkers to think? I have to believe that because Du Bois shouts out to so many black institutions, he is well aware that these African-American institutions are creating women teachers to go out into the world. And although we wish he would make women more visible, I think they are here reading between the lines and he does respect that reading between the lines. Um, at the same time, there's no doubt about it, he has a masculinist tone here. And, uh, but, he acknowledges by naming these schools that women are important. And also to your question, let's remember that he feminizes the city of Atlanta. I have been wrestling with that. Um, one reason why he does it is because he wants to draw this connection to the myth of Atlanta and she's a woman. Okay, got it. Another reason is because, as I told you, the origins of the name itself might be related to a particular woman, right? Uh, Martha Lumpkin. But taking that off the table, why else would Du Bois feminize the city of Atlanta? I think that's a tribute to Atlanta. I think what he's doing by feminizing Atlanta, in other words, in addition to all of that, is to suggest there's something about women that we want to hold on to as we move forward. Uh, women in 19th century American society were cast as the keepers 
of the spiritual lives of their families, right? Okay, if you're familiar with piety, purity, domesticity, submission, the idea of 19th century true womanhood, women were to be the role models of piety and religiosity, not only to members of their own family, but also to members of the culture at large. And I think by feminizing Atlanta, he may be calling our attention to, even though that also is sexist, to suggest that women have some kind of corner on the spirit. But he's suggesting that we need to connect to that feminine side <laughs> as much as we need to, as African-Americans, connect to what may be stereotypically seen as what men do, which is go out in the world and make money. All right, he's all for that. But I think he's also calling attention to the idea that we have to be able to honor the spirit and make room for the spirit and make room for soul growth and make room for culture, which are not connected to money. And since women in the homes were the powers uh, connected to that, women in the homes were responsible for those activities, teaching the children how to play musical instruments, for example, bringing the family together after a meal to read a Bible. I think there's your women in this text. But I caution you, uh, dear readers, uh, not to overdetermine that, as we would say in literary criticism. Uh, we have to acknowledge that Du Bois is a person of his times. And he is sexist and masculinist. And we have to acknowledge that. Um, but I think that I can give him that, that he's honoring women's work, a particular kind of work that we had purview over. It was respectable for women to have that power in their communities. And we see that legacy today. I'm a Baptist. Uh, we see that legacy today in the role of Black women in Afro-Protestant churches, right? We are everywhere in the African-American church. And that's that legacy of women being empowered to give spiritual direction. Yeah. Thank you, Barbara. Um, and we, we know that this is 1903. Uh, this is early in uh, Du Bois's career. And I yes. think that looking forward, uh, we have other examples of how Absolutely. he uh, includes women, but we will yes. yeah. And if I can, if I can just, that wonderful point that you make, um, Dr. Jones Sneed, and if I could add to that, let's not forget that when Du Bois very shortly uh, founds the Crisis Magazine, right, the organ of, or becomes the editor, rather, of the Crisis Magazine, um, one of his closest confidants at the crisis is Jesse Redmond Fawcett the African-American novelist who becomes the literature editor and nurtures so many scions of the Harlem Renaissance like Langston Hughes and Zora Neale Hurston. So he is a part of that. Yes. That's very good point. Very okay. Good point. <laughs> um, hello, Maynard Cedar, um, uh, uh, my uh, former colleague. <laughs> he asked, here Du Bois is arguing for a liberal arts education as a way forward for African-American youth and society. Has he begun to think about moving in in 1903 to establishing the civil rights organization, the NAACP started in 1909? Okay, I wouldn't say necessarily in this chapter, but certainly one of the vibes of the book is that idea of civil rights engagement. Uh, we've been talking a lot here in my neck of America about what civil rights engagement meant. I teach uh, about the civil rights movement. I'm teaching a class right now about the civil rights movement and I'm really um, um, working um, very deeply with the um, ideas of nonviolent direct social action. And I'm struck at how consistently the activists of the 40s, 50s, and 60s defined that at the core of civil rights engagement was community. Um, it's sexy to think about civil rights engagement as marching and, and picketing and boycotting, and they are very effective tools for social change. But at the core 
was building a community. You don't go on a march without community. Remember, there was a ritual by the um, end of the 1950s here in the South where before a march, before a picket line, Black people would come together in the church and we would have mass meetings. And most of the people in that church weren't going to get arrested. They weren't going to go out and raise their voices against authority, but they came to support the few who did. That's community. And in this book, and in this chapter, Du Bois is telegraphing that idea, community. What is Atlanta University? What is Howard? What is Fisk? What are all the universities that he names in this chapter if they are not communities? And here's where he does talk about men and women working together on behalf of a greater goal beyond themselves, which is building African-American society in struggle. I can't say enough. And I wanna write an essay now on how he's using this word striving and struggle. Again, if you want to tease out where the civil rights moments might be in this chapter, I think another place that the civil rights movement resides is in his use of this idea of struggle. And again, it's not in the negative sense that we might be inclined to think about. Struggling is a mighty project <laughs> for African-Americans. It is the project for African-Americans of the 20th century, and I would argue the 21st. Uh, Ta-Nehisi Coates, I'm sitting here with his memoir, uh, Between the World and Me. If you haven't read it, I think this makes a nice coda to chapter five. Ta-Nehisi Coates tells his son, Samori, we are defined by struggle. We are a people in struggle. And he doesn't use it to uh, feel sorry for himself or encourage his son to feel sorry for himself. The idea is out of that comes our strength. We wouldn't be here still <laughs> if we hadn't struggled. That is who we are. And it's a mighty power. And it is something that we give to the United States as a gift. I think that this summer in the streets of America, you saw again and again, the gift of African-Americans is our ability to move toward the fire. We don't run away from it. We've learned to go into the fire, to go into struggle. That's the civil rights movement. Nonviolent direct social action was not passive. In all the literature, the activists maintain this is energy at work because we are shifting the mindset of white supremacists. And we are transforming our own minds yes. from dehumanized, objectified, colonized to I'm just as good as anyone else. And these are my rights and I don't have to earn them and I'm entitled. All of that is part of this legacy of struggle. It's been a positive thing for African-Americans, even though we haven't received closure yet. It is what propels us forward, striving. And I think that's the language, that is the language of the civil rights struggle. Strive. Striving. Yes, thank that's the language of the civil rights movement right there. Oh, thank you. Uh, this just makes us feel so good about, you know, bringing this chapter to fruition, to life. Um, yes. um, Cam Wilson asked, this chapter seems as if it could be written today. Oh, man. The, do you see the parallels <laughs> between then and these same battles in present day? Brilliant question. Yes. And uh, I, for the sake of time, I didn't talk about my last slide and you don't have to go to it. But my last slide, if you can see it, I've copied it. I actually found an image of a sneaker with wings. Atalanta is usually portrayed in visual iconography as having winged feet, like Mercury, Hermes, the messenger god. And this slide includes a list of ways in which I see this chapter is resonating with our times. 
On page 48, Du Bois says that a threat to the progress of African-American Southerners is, quote, the rebirth of law and order, end quote. How many times have we heard that phrase, law and order? And what Du Bois does, and he mentions law and order again in this text elsewhere, he uses it sardonically, sarcastically, to refer to mob law. When he says law and order, he means what we as African Americans all too often understand, sadly, law and order to be. It is not justice, it is injustice. It's a reflection of mob rule. It's a reflection of white supremacy. And so that's how he's using law and order here. And the way in which we've seen politicians use law and order in a way that dog whistles to white supremacists is straight out of Du Bois's time. Mm -hmm. Two, yeah. the, idea of, the idea of making money and creating universities whose main objective is to churn out money makers is absolutely very relevant to today. Page 52, I want to make this a banner and put it over my office door. The function of the university is simply, I'm sorry, the function of the university is not simply to teach breadwinning. There it is. Yeah. There's more to us than that. And we are here to learn. We are here to be inspired by learning. We are here to learn to think. We are here to be creative. And we're to do that without always connecting to the end goal of making money. Yeah. We're here to learn for learning's sake. That's, that's important. Uh, and again, not to preclude money making, but to say money making cannot be the be all and end all of education. Yeah, and it's not something that's going to make very us very modern. Yeah, it's not going to make us happy either. In the yes. long run, yes. Um, Absolutely. <laughs> Emily Owls asks, "How is Du Bois's vision of mutuality or unity between black and white different from the vision expressed by Booker T. Washington in his Atlanta Exposition address?" <laughs> you're, making, you're, making, you're making me work tonight. Well, uh, it's been mentioned in some of the earlier talks for this community that uh, Booker T. Washington was a pragmatist. I prefer that word over opportunist. He was a pragmatist. In other words, he understood where the majority of his people were in the Deep South being threatened, being terrorized. I can't tell you how many times the word genocide appears in the writings of African-American leaders in the 1880s, 1890s, and first decade of the 20th century. There was a palpable sense among many African-American communities and community leaders, preachers and teachers, that we were gonna be eradicated. The violence was escalating in that way. And it's in that context, I think, it's easy to decontextualize Booker T. Washington and to say, you know, what an Uncle Tom. But you have to remember, in the context of that times, without federal protection, I mean, and even before the end of the Reconstruction, uh, there were Klan-like vigilante groups that were terrorizing African-American Southerners. And so I think what Washington is trying to work out is, how to protect these masses, how to keep the schools from being burned down. Many of these schools never made it to university level because they were burned down by these vigilante mobs. Yeah. So it was protection that Booker T. Washington, I think, was thinking about survival of the race as much as he was thinking about how to make the race prosper. How do we survive when we are constantly being threatened, terrorized, and snuffed out? How can I create a, a balance of some kind with people who think that we are, we are waste, a waste and who don't want to spend taxpayer money on us and would rather see us either go back to wherever or they'll do it for us. This is, this is the reality that Booker yeah. T. Washington and his leadership were facing. 
And so he works out this uh, agreement, so to speak, with white Southern leaders and white Northern leaders. Give us a chance and we will become productive citizens. You don't need to bring all the immigrants over here. He says that, right? Yeah. We are here and we know how to work because we've been doing it since slavery. Let us continue working. And if you do that and let us build our communities and our churches and our schools and buy our land, we will leave you, we will not go to your churches, we will not marry you. He's trying to create a kind of truce around yeah. the North. Yeah, yeah. In light of this racial violence. It's, it's very interesting, um, Dr. McCaskill, because <clears throat> that young African-American boy that John Greenleaf Whittier is talking about in that poem, yes. that is an actual um, African-American uh, that he's actually talking about. One that Howard actually gave access to education. And mm -hmm. the readers of that time knew exactly who that young African-American boy was. And mm -hmm. he was one that had gone to a Tuskegee-like school probably um, yes. and came out in support of uh, Washington rather than oh, the war. Yeah, so oh, in between yeah. the line, yeah, in between the line, people of that time that understood exactly who he was talking about. But mm -hmm. we're running out of time. Uh, Catherine Stevens, this was amazing. What do you think of the significance of Du Bois rewriting the myth, changing the in ending of Atalanta flying away or striving to on wings rather yes. than being turned into a, you know, something different. Yes. The lions. Oh, yes. Thank you for that. Thank you for that question. Uh, I think he's positioning black readers toward hope. Uh, remember, he's been come down pretty hard in this chapter on African-Americans. He's cri criticized us for creating less than uh, uh, superior schools and passing them off as universities. He's criticized us for following the Pied Piper call of carpetbaggers and thinking of how to make a quick buck instead of thinking about how to train our children. He's criticized us for abandoning our first generation leaders, the preachers and the teachers, again, for the quick uh, buck. Uh, he needs to balance that critique in order to be heard. <laughs> uh, that is one of the techniques that we as writers use. When you're going to be critical, you better find something good to say yeah. about the audience as well. And he also really believes. Um, I don't want to downplay his sincere belief in possibility. Du Bois was always a believer in possibility. Again, yeah. He wouldn't have said strife and striving over and over as he does if he didn't intend to convey to African-Americans, we've come a long way and we have a long way to go and we can do this. Uh, there's a spiritual that he doesn't use in any of his chapters. Um, we've, uh, I don't believe you brought me this far to leave me. Um, that's his spirit. Uh, yeah. I don't believe God brought us this far to leave us. And we have a destiny. Du Bois believed that African-Americans, and again, going back to an earlier question about civil rights, that's a civil rights mo moment to mm -hmm. say, we have a destiny and our destiny is to bring to fruition the values that the signers of the Declaration of Independence say they had, mm -hmm. <laughs> many things we know. Yeah. <laughs> necessarily have right there's a sense among african-american leaders throughout our history in this country that we are a destined people we are destined to fulfill the prophecy of the founding fathers and mothers we are destined to bring america to its place in the world as a beacon of justice and equity and opportunity and yeah. you can hear those strains in this book and in this chapter. Thank you. Uh, one last question um, uh, from um, Marissa Massery. Uh, thank you so much for this amazing presentation. Uh, forgive the lack of clarity in this question. The three golden apples pitfalls that you outlined, were these warnings specifically meant for the black community? 
I ask because I'm guessing Du Bois must have known that white America already overvalued capitalism at the turn of the century. I am curious about this dynamic and how Du Bois thought the black community could steer clear of excessive material prosperity, given that the already strong current of capitalism. Any thoughts? I, I love that you bring us back to this idea of mutuality because he begins with that idea, doesn't he? With this image of the one-armed white general extending his hand to the African-American boy, one generation to another, one race to another, a one class to another, right? Thinking of Francis's remarks about the history of this boy. So the answer is yes and no. Yes, there is a, to some extent, Du Bois is talking to two audiences. His cautionary tale about wealth is one directed to both blacks and whites. The colleges, I think he's talking to black people. <laughs> he's, very yeah. clear. he's very clear in his language, actually, yeah. um, this chapter that he is criticizing even though we know that these colleges were founded through alliances with white philanthropists and right. the first phase of these teachers were white teachers, he is cr criticizing directly black people. People, yes. That's yes and no, okay? It depends on which apple you're talking about. <laughs> he, you. blames, he blames capitalism and its distractions, um, which aren't the doing of black people. But in the end, by the time we get to the universities, He's suggesting to his black readers, the blame rests squarely on your shoulders. You started this, you established these inferior schools, you yeah. passed them off. Yeah. So you are obligated to do better going forward. Thank and you. I love that I love that. Can I say one more thing about that? Okay. Think about it again in relationship to how he's begun. He's begun with this kind of image of a passing of a torch. The educated white general is tapping the young black uh, boy who's coming out of the ignorance of slavery. By the end of this chapter, we don't need the white people. <laughs> in other words, but <laughs> the voice is saying, look, we can do this on our own. Yeah. We can some mistakes here. Yeah. And I really love that. I really love and, and to punctuate that again, go back to the last paragraph where. He positions in this misty industrial Atlanta, a sparkling stone hall with the stars twinkling above it. That's us. We made that. That, yes, yes. So he's suggesting self-determination can take us far. Yeah. We have to also be aware that we can make mistakes too. Yeah. Just as we may be vindicated uh, from slavery doesn't mean that we are perfect either. Yes. I'm sorry for the questions that we did not get to, but thank you so much, Dr. Barbara McCaskill, for your wonderful Look. presentation and, um, and the answer to this question. You've just brought to life chapter five for us in a way that, you know, I, we couldn't even imagine. So thank you. I would like to say that if you share my email in the chat, I welcome questions personally. I'm sorry that I didn't have a chance to answer questions, but if you'd like to send me a question directly to my email, I can say that I'll get to you immediately because I am a busy university teacher, but I will get to you. <laughs> thank you for being so thank you for being so generous. Um, so if you could put your uh, email address in the, in the chat oh. while we go over. Um, okay. Thank all of you for joining us this evening. Um, we're gonna take a break for Thanksgiving um, and then we'll be back on uh, December 1st uh, with a discussion of chapter six of the training of black men with our guest, uh, Dr. Horace D. Ballard, Ballard, who is the curator of African of American art at Williams College Museum of Art. And uh, I ask that you stay with us uh, again for a short video, a beautiful video about Clinton Church restoration. But thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for being with us this evening.
Lift every voice and sing till earth and heaven ring, ring with the harmonies of liberty. Let our rejoicing rise high as the listening skies. Let it resound loud as the rolling sea. Hello, I'm Ray Gunn, chairman of the Clinton Church Restoration Project. We are creating a nonprofit center for African American history and culture at the historic Clinton Amy Zion Church in Gray Barrington, which I attended for over 70 years. The Berkshires are rich with black history that is little known and sometimes misunderstood. For example, my ancestor, Agrippa Hull, served in the Revolutionary War and was the largest black landowner in Stockbridge. Once completed, our center will tell his story and those of W.E.B. Du Bois, Reverend Esther Dozier, and many more. Please help by donating to this historic project. We need your support. Thank you. Oh, freedom. Oh, Freedom, oh freedom, over me, and before I'd be a slave, I'll be buried in my grave, and go home to my Lord and be free. Oh, there's no hiding place down there. Oh, there's no hiding place down there. See, I went to the rock to hide my face. Rock cried out, no hiding place, no hiding place down there. Gonna pitch tent on the old campground. Pitch my tent on the old campground. Gonna pitch my tent on the old campground. Give that devil another round. No hiding place down there. See, there's no hiding place down there. Oh, there's no hiding place down there. See, you went to the rock. Had my face, rock cried out, no hiding place, no hiding place down there, no hiding place down there, oh, there's no hiding place down there.